We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have with me. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this one. Free our mind. My mind. just a ride. ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love, love. love. Corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish side of the moon. Welcome to the Irish side of the moon. My name is Gabriel Logue. I'll be your host for this show. And Porik was with us last week talking with Dr. John Apsley. And if you want to visit Dr. Apsley's site, it is dr.apsley.com. And the site's called The Regeneration Effect, Overcoming Advanced Stages of Cancer and Other Chronic Degenerative Diseases. Now listen to the interview myself. And very interesting what Dr. Apsley talks about. Um, with regards structured clean water, mineralized soil, and the bicarbonate soda as a remedy for cancer. Uh, again, this is information that has to be reiterated. We have to keep uh, putting it out there so it becomes public knowledge because right now it's not. There is the one allopathic method and everything else is poo-pooed as quackery um, or dangerous. So it is up to us, the people, um, to educate each other and, well, educate ourselves first um, because, uh, well, I don't know about you, but if you're like me, um, we can never learn enough about the simplicity of life and how wondrous the body really is if we create the correct terrain on the inside um, definitely worth a listen to that show and if you're a first time listener and you're wondering how do you get some of the previous shows just pop along to the Irish side of the moon dot blogspot dot com there you can download for free any of the previous interviews uh, it'll be listed under the Irish side of the moon interviews uh, everything's archived uh, that we've done over the last year and a half. And if you remember, as you will, uh, pop along to the Irish Side of the Moon Facebook page, join, and leave a comment, join a discussion, leave a massive carbon footprint. I implore you, leave a massive carbon footprint. Now, all right, joining us right now on the Irish Side of the Moon for the first time is Dr. Irving Krish. Uh, Dr. Kirsch is a professor of psychology at the University of Hull in the UK and professor emeritus at the University of Connecticut in the US. Dr. Kirsch is noted for his research on placebo effects, antidepressants, expectancy and hypnosis. Uh, Dr. Kirsch is the originator of response expectancy theory and his analysis of clinical trials of antidepressants have influenced official treatment guidelines in the United Kingdom. Dr. Kirsch received his PhD in psychology from the University of Southern California in 1975. And get this, whilst a graduate student, he produced in conjunction with the National Lampoon a hit single and subsequent record album entitled The Missing White House Tips. And the album was nominated for a Grammy Award as Best Comedy Recording in 1974. And here he is on the Irish Side of the Moon. Dr. Kirsch, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the air. Uh, you're very welcome. Now, before we get into the very serious business of placebo effects, antidepressants, etc., you got to tell us about the missing White House tips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, this came out when, during the uh, days of the Watergate um, uh, scandal in the U.S., and uh, it was revealed at, at a certain point that uh, Nixon had made these uh, uh, tape recordings in his uh, office. There was eventually one gap in them, uh, about uh, 20 minutes long, so hence the missing White House tapes. And uh, I was sitting with a friend around uh, uh, our living room, as, as you can, as you 
mentioned, I was a graduate student at the, at the time, and uh, Nixon had made a 20-minute uh, radio uh, speech in which he explained why he would not make public the tape recordings that he had made in the Oval Office in the White House. And we were sitting around chatting, and I don't remember which of us said which, but one of us said, well, you know, uh, he'll probably eventually have to release them, but, you know, by then he'll probably have doctored them. And then the other said, well, you know, why don't we do that? And we phoned up a radio station in, uh, in California and uh, asked if we could get a copy, a, a tape recording of, of the uh, Nixon 20 minutes radio speech, television radio speech. And they sent it to us. And uh, having no experience at all, we went and found a recording studio and an engineer and paid him. I think we paid him $500 back in those days. Wow. And uh, began cutting and splicing with a razor blade and tape. That's the way you had to do it in, the, in those days. <laughs> and turned the 20-minute uh, speech of Nixon's into a five-minute confession in which he says things like, um, uh, this has been, the Attorney General has assured me this has been the best cover-up since the assassination <laughs> of President Kennedy. And it's all his words from, from his talk, just <laughs> taking part of one sentence, part of another, and splicing it uh, together. And then we shopped around for somebody who would uh, put it out on, on, you know, on the market. And most record companies were just afraid to do it. They, 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 they were very nice to us sometimes. They gave us an office and a phone to call others' suggestions. But they were all afraid of repercussions, um, especially with respect to their taxes. And uh, we got in touch finally with uh, National Lampoon, and they were willing to do it. And they had a, a contract with Blue Thumb Records, which uh, guaranteed them a single and an album each year, with them having complete artistic control. So Blue Thumb could not refuse uh, to do it. And they put out the single, and the single did uh, well, and they asked us to turn it into half of an album. We did one side of the album. The other side involved people like um, John Belushi and, and Chevy Chase. And uh, it was skits, but the side we did were, again, getting more recordings of Nixon's uh, press conferences and speeches and editing them and turning them into uh, as humorous as we could. Uh, oh, um, satire. And at this stage, did you, uh, you had graduated. Did you uh, not think of maybe taking up a, um, a profession in law? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this was just for fun on the side. I, yeah. I was a year away from getting my PhD in psychology, uh, really in, <clears throat> enamored of the field, especially the research end of it. And so I proceeded with that. Well, you were probably the only person to actually get a confession out of, a confession out of Tricky Dick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I'm going to try and get a copy of the, the Missing White Heart tips. I had, I had tried earlier on just to, to give it a listen, but I wasn't successful just yet, but I'll keep, I'll keep trying. As a curious Good luck with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Where did your research really begin? When, when do you recall uh, you entered into this field? Um, were, were you a kid? Were you a teen? Did it start late? I mean, when did you really, when did it bite? When did it grab you? In, in terms of psychology generally, in, in research yeah. in psychology generally, that was when I was um, at university. I was at um, a uh, Los Angeles City College, which is a two-year uh, university college. The terminology is different on the other side of the pond than it is here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, uh, I was majoring in music to begin with. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking of becoming a professional musician, I had done some professional work the music, uh, with music, was thinking of becoming a professional teacher of music, and took a psych psychology course and just fell in love with it. I just thought it was so interesting and uh, switched majors and uh, saved myself from a life as a mediocre musician into a life as, I think, a pretty good uh, psychologist. Okay, and this is back in the in the seventies, the the early seventies, when right psychology really hadn't been um, infiltrated by big pharma, etc. And you were coming out of the sort of the humanistic um, era as well. So a lot of that was that was was that um, pretty um, close to the mark. Yeah, all that's uh, uh, true. And I, I had no real interest in pharmacology. I wasn't interested in antidepressants at that. 
uh, time, uh, I got interested in a field called learning theory. How do people and animals learn? How do they change their behavior? What, what processes bring that uh, about? And in the process of looking at that question, I began getting interested in, in expectancies, people's beliefs and their expectations, how they acquire them, how they, how they get changed, and the effect that it has on their behavior and on their perceptions of themselves. And that was, became, that became the main focus uh, up until today of, of my uh, research and, and uh, professional activities in the field. Okay, quick question. Would you say you're more right-brained or left-brained? I have no idea. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Good answer. Um, I just threw that out because uh, the the music, the interest in music, and a love of music usually would uh, indicate an artistic, you know, the, which is a more right brained. But looking at your research, I mean, you, you obviously have to have a, a high degree of left brain analysis analysis to to do what you do and to um, put to put it into uh, logical sequence. So just throwing it out there. Well, you know, uh, there's a, a pretty strong correlation between interest in music and uh, and uh, interest in in science and, and logic and math. Uh, Einstein's big passion was as a, a violinist, and uh, he loved to play. And sometimes uh, I thought maybe that should have been his. Uh, career as one example and it's very common to find mathematicians in particular who play uh, music and, and love music and there's a, a real mathematical side to music as well you may recall back from the ancient Greeks the music of the spheres which uh, had to do with the, the mathematics of music and of the universe mm. yeah the good the good ones the good mathematicians huh yep yeah. now Response expectancy theory. Yep. Give us the whole background on your development of that and what it means to to a human being. Sure. Uh, you know, we have brains, and in some ways our brains function like an expectancy machine. That is, why do we have brains? We have brains in order to be able to uh, predict what's going to happen next, predict what's going to happen as a consequence of our actions, excuse me, <clears throat> so that we, we then adjust our behavior in order to maximize what we think is going to happen. Uh, it, it, it just pervades our, our, our lives. Uh, you decide whether you're going to listen to this program on, on the basis of whether you think it's going to be interesting. That's an expectancy, a belief about the future. Is it going to be interesting? Is it, is it not going to be interesting? I went into this line of work because I thought it would be fun. That was an expectancy. People uh, buy stock, make investments uh, based on what they think is going to happen. So our, our brains are geared towards anticipating uh, the future. Uh, the, one of the things that occurred to me is there are two different kinds of uh, expectancies you can have. You can have expectancies about what's going to happen out there in the world. The stock's going to go up, the stock's going to go down, it's going to rain, it's not going to rain. Well, if I'm in the British Isles, it probably is going to rain. Um, that's one kind of expectancy. And another kind of expectancy, what I've called and others now call response expectancy, has to do with what's going to happen inside of you. I'm going to feel differently. It's not that something out there is going to change, but something inside me is going to change. I'm going to feel happy. I'm going to feel sad. Something's going to hurt. Something's going to hurt less. Um, and that kind of expectancy has a particular characteristic of being self-confirming. It creates what have been called self-fulfilling prophecies. Mm -hmm. That is, if I expect something is going to hurt, it will hurt more than if I don't think it will hurt. If I think I'm going to, if I think that I've taken something that's going to block the pain, the pain will feel lower than if I don't think I've, the pain is going to be blocked. And that, of course, is the basis of what we call the placebo effect. You give somebody a, a, a pill and you say it's such and such a drug and, and it's likely to have such and such an effect. And people tend to have that effect even when it's just a sugar pill. It's an inner, inner pill. It has no active ingredients in it at all. And because of that, it has become... Um, 
the norm, the standard in countries across the world before you approve a new medication, you have to show that it is more effective than a placebo, that what you're getting is not just a placebo effect. And that is in order to control for these ex response expectancy effects. Okay, so before we get into the, the, the antidepressants and, and placebos, which is a big part of your work, uh, the placebo effect, um, just to sort of uh, go into the response expectancy theory, say, like, for instance, I go to the dentist. Right. Now, I'm expecting pain. I have a very low threshold for pain. I sit into the chair. Now, before the dentist even says hello, I'm sweating, okay? Right. And then I hear the zzzz, and my feet are twitching, and I can feel yep. pain, and he's like, I'm not even near you yet. Now, yep. by the time he gets to me, uh, I'm on um, red alert, and something that may not have a huge effect on somebody else, I'm going up through the roof. Um, he loves seeing me coming. He really does. So what you're saying is by changing the inside subjective, there can be a huge physiological response based on the expectancy of that pain. So if I, yeah, if you, I can, you can feel it differently. You can feel it differently depending on how you expect it's going to feel to you. And it's, it operates just in the way you described it. If you think it's going to really hurt, it's really going to be terrible, it's going to be unbearable, that will tend to make it true in and of itself. Augment the pain that's caused by the, the, the actual pain stimulus. And if you think that you've taken something, and, and I can't, see, you can't talk about response expectancy, uh, the idea of response expectancy without talking about placebos because it's perhaps the prime example of, um, of, of response expectancies. There are others, but that's, that's the, the most typical place where, where you see its operation. Well, let's talk about placebo. Sure. Uh, One uh, of my favorite topics. Okay. Explain to um, myself and everyone listening, say somebody hasn't a clue about what a placebo is, Placebo 101. Okay, now placebo typically is a pill or an injection, sometimes even a surgical procedure, some physical intervention uh, that doesn't have the physical properties that are ascribed to it. So it might be a pill that you're given and you're told it's an antidepressant or it's morphine or it's some other uh, uh, drug, and it really isn't that drug. It, it really doesn't reduce pain chemically. It doesn't have that chemical effect. Uh, the injection is really just saline. It's a neutral substance that in and of itself has no physical effect on you. Your belief might create an effect, but the substance as a substance doesn't. There's, uh, there, there are uh, placebo surgeries that people have used in research trials to, in, to validate a surgical procedure in which the patient just gets cut open and then sewn back up again and you never do the, 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 the um, surgical procedure. It's called sham surgery or placebo surgery. So nothing is being done physically to produce an effect, but you think the effect that you're getting something that, that could produce that effect. And, and that something that you get, that inert um, uh, substance, pill, capsule, that is a placebo. Okay, so you're giving and an it, idea. You're giving, them an, you're giving them a belief, you're instilling a belief that, that they are getting something that has some particular effect. And that belief might produce the effect. I say might because expectancies can change some things and not others. Um, expectancies can make you feel pain. It can make you feel less pain. It can make you happy. It can make you sad. It can lead you to think, to, to experience things as more funny than they, than they otherwise uh, would, would seem to you. <laughs> they, it, they, um, they can't mend broken bones. They don't seem to have any effect on the rate of, of healing of, of, of tissue. Um, they uh, don't alter blood sugar, so you can give somebody, uh, you can give a diabetic, I wouldn't recommend doing this, you could give a diabetic a, a placebo instead of insulin, it won't have the effect. Okay. So their placebos affect mostly subjective states and the physical concomitants, the physical things that are associated with that subjective state. So if, if, if you make me happy, 
there are all kinds of physical things that go along with being happy. You might have, uh, if I'm excited, my heart's going to beat faster, pulse will go uh, uh, faster. Uh, there will be changes in my brain associated with any subjective state that you induce, no matter how you induce it, whether you induce it by physical means or by a placebo or by changing my expectations in some other way. But it's, it's the subjective change and the physical uh, correlates of that subjective change that you affect with placebos and with response expectancies. Okay. You mentioned um, placebo or sham surgery. Can you give me an example of um, a placebo or sham surgery that sure. and the, the result? The, the, first, the first trials of in, in which clinical trials in, in which sham surgery was used that I know of was done way back in the 1950s. And at that time, there was a surgical procedure that was being used for angina. And that, this procedure was called mammary ligation. And the idea was that you would tie off the mammary artery and that would put pr uh, pressure on other uh, uh, routes that would open up things. And... It was thought to be very successful. They was, were doing these and, and were reporting 80% success rate. <clears throat> and in two different uh, clinics uh, in the U.S., somebody had enough concern about the procedure that they decided to do a trial uh, with sham surgery, well, two trials simultaneously. As far as I know, just independently by coincidence, these two trials were, were done at around the same time. Both were published separately. And in both of those trials, half of the patients, these were patients with angina, half were given the real surgery in which uh, they opened them up and they tied off the mammary uh, artery and they uh, sewed them back up again. And uh, the other half, uh, got the sham operation. They were opened up, they were sewn back up, but they never tied off uh, the ar uh, artery. And lo and behold, both groups of patients improved and improved dramatically and improved at a level of about 75% improvement regardless of whether they'd gotten the real surgery or the sham surgery. And needless to say, we don't do mem mammary ligations anymore. So that, that was the first. And for a long time, they didn't do any other trials, but since then, more recently, there have been other trials of uh, sham uh, surgery. I think the most famous is uh, the uh, studies that were done on uh, arthroscopic surgery for uh, osteoarthritis of the knee, um, in which they did, a, again, it's a, an operation that has been reported to have a huge success rate. Um, and a team out in Texas did a, a study in which some of the patients were given the real operation and some were just given sham surgery. They open up the knee, they close it up, they didn't do the surgical uh, procedures that are done in the real uh, operation. And actually for the first two weeks and then even for as lasting as long as the first year, people in, who had gotten the sham surgery did somewhat better than people who were given the real surgery. Uh, and by the end of two years, there was absolutely no difference between the groups. I'd be interested to find out all the different variables in those two groups, what, what they did, what diet, dietary change, what um, self-perception changes, um, did they change where they went to eat, did they change their music, all these things. Uh, I'm super interested in all this stuff myself. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's fascinating when um, when I hear something like that, is that again, it's it's uh, how deep and powerful is our um, subjective experience, and underneath, what's what's really beneath that that's driving all this. You one of the things that's interesting stuff. about one of the things that's interesting about those particular trials is they did interview the patients afterwards, and and, and they got reports of their perception of how they experienced it and what they thought went on and how they were feeling and how much better they were feeling and, and how their behaviors had changed. And some of the, their comments were reported in, in the articles, the scientific articles in which the trials were described, and also in the press, uh, some others were uh, reported. And, and they, they make fascinating reading. Um, if you don't mind me brazenly plugging my most recent uh, book, you can find some of those quotes in, uh, uh, I've, I've quoted in, in um, uh, The Emperor's New Drugs, which uh, 
is a book that's been published in the UK by the Bodley Head, a division of Random House, and in the US by Basic Books, and uh, goes mainly over the uh, the my work on antidepressants and the work of others on antidepressants, but also has a couple of chapters devoted to the placebo effect. Okay, and that's The Emperor's New Drugs Exploding the Antidepressant Myth, um, published by Bodley Head in the UK. That's correct. Um, we'll get one more plug-in before the end of the show. I, I, I can um, <laughs> promise you that. Yeah, because the placebo effect, I had done a little psychology myself in uni, and the 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 power of, I don't know if you want to call it the mind, or how it interacts with the subjective before it gets to the objective, that was um, the, the real interest. I wanted to go into parapsychology, but the... The lecturers just laughed at me and poo-pooed, and they were like, we're not having parapsychology in, in uh, Derry. Get out of here. So I was like, all right, to see you later on. But <laughs> now that I've got you here, um, placebo, let's really go into placebo. Let's, let's for, for everyone, um, take, take us through now um, what, what you've uncovered um, in, in, in a way that will lead us all down the placebo path. Okay, well, what I've uncovered, uh, I've done a lot, I did a lot of research just on placebos, and, and, but what I wound up uncovering more than anything else had to do with how much the response that people get when they take antidepressant drugs is really a placebo effect, really just a response to the placebos rather than a chemical effect of the drugs. And I discovered that almost by chance, Serendipitously, not not. I didn't set out to show that. I, uh, when I started doing that research, I was in clinical practice as a psychotherapist. I had depressed patients. When my patients were very depressed, I, I referred them to get uh, prescriptions of antidepressants to help them out, and they seemed many of them seemed to be helped by that. Like everybody else, I assumed that was a real drug effect. So I wasn't interested in that. I I, I knew, and I have to now put quotes. Of, around the new because that implies that something is true that I thought was true at the time. I, I believed that antidepressants worked and that they produced the chemical changes that could help people when they were very severely depressed and make it easy for them, easier for them to then be able to work on some of their psychological uh, issues. Um, so I wasn't that interested in investigating it, but I ha was interested and had been interested for years in expectancies and the placebo effect. And it occurred to me that there ought to be a pretty large placebo effect in the treatment of depression. And the reason for that is that um, one of the characteristics of depression, one of the central features of it, is that people feel hopeless. Uh, they don't, they, they, they're in a terrible state and they don't think they'll ever get better. So that's an expectancy, isn't it, a, a hopelessness. It's a belief that a terrible state of affairs is not going to get any better. And if you give them effective treatment, or what they think is effective treatment, if you lead them to think that they're going to be getting something that's going to help them, that instills hope, that changes that negative expect expectancy into a more positive ex expectancy. It counters the hopelessness that is so characteristic of depression. And because of that, it seemed to me that there ought to be at least a decent-sized placebo effect in depression. And I set out with one of my uh, postgraduate students, uh, Guy Saperstein, to look for that, to see if we can find how much does a placebo affect uh, uh, a depression. So we looked at clinical trials, uh, we looked for clinical trials in which people had been given a placebo, and then now if you give somebody a placebo and they change, it may not be a placebo effect. They might have changed even if you hadn't given them a placebo. If you have a cold and I give you a pill, I don't care whether it's an active drug or a placebo, you'll get better, but then you'll get better even if I don't give you the, the, the pill or the active drug. So if I want to know the placebo effect, I have to compare it to what would happen if I didn't even give them a placebo. Mm. And so we looked for clinical trials in which people had been assessed for changes in their depression without being given any treatment at all. Okay. And, of course, in, in these clinical trials, 
there aren't clinical trials of, anti of, of, of depression where you just give people placebos and you don't give them an active drug. I mean, those that don't exist. So we also had, when we, we went to these trials and we got the data, we had in our hands also the drug data and weren't particularly interested. We were interested in the difference between placebo and no treatment, but we had the data on what happened when you gave people the drug as well, so we included that in the analysis. And that's where our first surprise came and what led to a shift in the focus of my research because what we found, not only was there a very large response to placebo, and not only was it really a placebo effect because people didn't get much better if you didn't do anything at all, but they did get very much better if you gave them a, a placebo, but there wasn't much of a drug effect. That is the difference between the uh, response to the drug and the response to this placebo pill, this inert pill, uh, was minimal. It, it was nothing that you would write home about, nothing that would make that much of a difference in anybody's life. People were getting better regardless of whether they got the drug uh, or the placebo. They got a little bit more better if, if they got the real drug, but again, the difference was very small and, and not large enough to be clinically meaningful. So you had, you trawled through existing studies, existing That's right. data. And w did you look for three groups, A group A, the group that was given the, the drug, group B that was given a placebo, and group C, a control that wasn't given anything? That's right. And we also wound up in, in finding studies that had controls that were not given anything. We also, some of these, uh, uh, almost all of these were, were uh, psychotherapy trials. So we also had data, data on psychotherapy. Um, so we had now data on being given a drug, being given a placebo, being given psychotherapy, usually for something like 10 20 to 20 weeks, uh, or being given nothing at all. Okay, so in that, uh, you found that the statistical difference was between the placebo and the drug was slight. Was yes, it 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 was it was very small. Um, much smaller than I would have expected. In, in the first study that we did, we only looked at the literature that had been published, the clinical trials that had been published. About 75% uh, of the change that you found in the group given the, the actual drug, you also found in the group given the placebo. That meant that only 25% of that improvement was a real drug effect. And for drugs that had been hailed as revolutionary of changing the way the, the way in which uh, dramatically changing the way in which depression had been treated as being some of the, the best uh, success stories of pharmacology that really seems small to us so what, um, did, what did you do with this information then you were well we published it and we and it was published and, and it was this was back in 1998 that that was published and, and it was very controversial and uh, many people just didn't believe it and one of the reactions was, and these were written reactions, was uh, there are so many trials out there, we know antidepressants work. If, if, if Kirsch and his colleagues are finding that antidepressants don't work, maybe they haven't looked at the right clinical trials. There must be something wrong with their analysis. And that, so that was the first uh, uh, reaction. And so the question is, what do we do next? And uh, a fellow in, in, in Washington, Tom Moore, at uh, Washington, George Washington University, um, came up with an idea. I'd never met him or heard of him. He, he contacted me out of the blue, and he had this marvelous idea and said, you know, why don't you replicate your own study? Do it again with a totally different data set. And, I, and let me tell you the data set you should use. Why don't you go to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the agency, which uh, is responsible for approving <clears throat> licensing uh, drugs so that they can be prescribed to patients, why don't you go to them and use the Freedom of Information Act? And using the Freedom of Information Act, you can get them to send you all of the uh, uh, data on all of the clinical trials that have been conducted by the drug companies in the process of, of getting their medications approved. And that seemed like a great idea. 
And so I said to Tom Moore, that's a great idea. Why don't we do it together? And we did. He went to the FDA. He applied under the Freedom of Information Act. He got the data. He uh, sent a copy of it down to, to me. Uh, at that time, I was at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we analyzed it together. And now we had a particularly interesting data set for a couple of reasons. One, of course, these are the data that that, uh, that were the basis for approving the drugs. If there's anything wrong with them, the drugs shouldn't have been improved in the, in, the, in, the, in the first place. Second is when you, it turns out that when you are just looking at the published clinical trials, you're missing almost half of the story. About 40% of the clinical trials that were sponsored by the drug companies in the process of getting their medications, their antidepressants approved, were never published. The data were just hidden. They were held uh, secret. They were never made public. Doctors had no way of, of knowing about them. Uh, insurance companies had no way of uh, uh, knowing about them. They were known only to the researchers, the drug companies, and the FDA, and now we had those data, and we analyzed those data, and that's when we found that the real effect of the antidepressants was even smaller than we had found looking at the published literature. See, when you look at the published literature, most of the trials show a statistically significant benefit of drug over placebo. About 75% of them show a statistically significant benefit of, of drug over placebo. When you look at the unpublished trials, the ones that were not sent to the journals, almost 90% of them show no significant difference at all, not even a statistical difference, let alone a, a small one, just not even a, a difference at all between drug and placebo. And when you put them all together, which is what we did, the published trials and the unpublished trials, you get an, a difference between drug and placebo that is really minimal. It's below the criteria set by NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which uh, draws up treatment policies for the National Health Service in the UK, it's below their threshold for an antidepressant being clinically meaningful or clinically significant, well below it. Um, hold, hold that thought. We'll be right back with Dr. Kirsch. And folks, stay tuned. You're listening to The Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter. You can join our Facebook group. And if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the irishsideofthemoon.ie. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information, personal empowerment. And welcome back once again to the Irish Side of the Moon. We're talking with Dr. Irvin Kirsch, author of The Emperor's New Drugs. Now, just before the break, Dr. Kirsch, you were talking about discovering in your, in your studies that the difference between placebos and antidepressants, the statistical difference was so small that it wouldn't manifest into any clinical difference thereby having real no positive benefit. So when you found that, where did you go from there? Well, we published those data as well. <clears throat> and, and the reaction this time was very different, I have to tell you. It was published in a journal called Prevention and uh, Treatment, which was one of the flagship journals of the American Psychological Association in the U.S. And uh, they... Knowing how controversial it was, they published it with a number of commentaries. They had 14 different authors that that uh, uh, wrote commentaries on on our analysis. And the f interesting thing about the reaction this time was there was no disputing our data at all. Everyone agreed that they were accurate, that this indeed was the size of the difference in the clinical trials. Uh, one set of commentators who were clinical trialists, who have done clinical uh, drug trials, uh, uh, commented, well, this is what some of our, my co our colleagues call the dirty little secret in the pharmaceutical literature. Uh, they knew it all along. And 
it was no surprise uh, uh, at, at all to them. They knew it. The FDA knew it. As I said, the drug companies obviously knew it. We hadn't really discovered anything. What we what we had done was to stumble upon a secret. We didn't had weren't discovering anything new. We were just making public uh, a secret known only to this very smaller group of people and not known to the public at large and not known by most uh, doctors. Okay. Um, an antidepressant really doesn't, according to the, the findings of your, your, your research, antidepressant doesn't give any more of a positive bonus or a positive effect than a placebo. Plus, uh, most antidepressants, if not all, have tremendous side effects uh, not associated with placebos. Can you speak to me and everyone listening about the side effects? Here, sure. If you, if you, go ahead. Here is something that, again, it's probably it's slightly semantic of me, but when a doctor takes their Hippocratic oath, which is I think has been done away with, the I think one of the first things is I shall do no harm. Well, right. side effects uh, plays right into harm. So I don't know how that um, gels with each other. Uh, if I was a doctor, I would really be conflicted. Well, of course, if you were a doctor before this research was done, you wouldn't know how small the, the real drug effect uh, uh, was because most of those data were hidden. So you can't blame doctors for that. They, they had no way of, of knowing uh, at all. But yes, the problem is that the benefit of the antidepressant over placebo is so small that it's hard to see how anybody could make a strong case that it's worth the risks. If you look at the list of side effects, they're quite large. Um, and they, some of them are potentially serious. They include uh, one of the most common side effects is sexual dysfunction um, as a side effect of SSRIs, the most commonly prescribed type of antidepressant. Um, and for young people, for, young, for children, adolescents, and young adults, one of the things that we have learned is that these SSRIs actually increase the risk of suicide. People that are depressed are at risk for suicide. They have a larger, higher rate of suicide, but those given an antidepressant as opposed to those given a placebo, that increases the, the likelihood of their trying to commit suicide. They're thinking, of, they're thinking about uh, suicide. And that's why uh, antidepressants now have what we call black box Warnings, just like the warnings that you get in packs of cigarettes, telling you that it, it may uh, increase the risk of, of suicide, especially again for young for young people. So yes, the 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 cost benefit, the relative when you try to weigh the benefits against the risks, you get a pretty dismal uh, picture. That is insane. Have you used or have others now used your um, model? to put in other data streams um, in, in their own fields uh, with regards to um, uh, drugs and medicines and what, what have I, you found? I haven't seen it done in other areas. Uh, our analysis has now been replicated both with the same data set and with other data sets and people seem to find pretty much the same thing. Uh, the numbers are very, very similar no, no matter which set of tri clinical trials um, you use no matter how you analyze the data, it come up pretty much the same. So we know they're reliable for antidepressants. It would make sense to do analyses like that for all conditions in which there are strong placebo effects um, and which there, you would want to know not just is the drug statistically better than the placebo, but how large is the difference? How much of that drug response really is a placebo effect? And, and um, that's something I, I think that needs to be done in, in more areas. What is your personal... I'm going to have to really push you out in a limb here. What is your personal feelings and thoughts uh, now that you've uncovered what you have uncovered. So now that you know that, hey, that, listen, this, the, 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 the effects, the, the positive effects that the public and indeed the medical profession are being sold by the pharmaceutical companies that 
uh, here's the antidepressant and here's here's the the one that you need to sell and use and here are the great benefits um, now that pe- more and more people know that a they really don't work and b they have so many attached side effects where does that leave you what do you what do you think or feel what's going on well I, I think there needs to be some there need to be some changes made in the way we approach the treatment of, of depression. Uh, first thing I need to say is that, and, and this I want to say to listeners of, of the program, if you're depressed, if you're on antidepressants, don't just stop taking your antidepressant uh, as a result of listening to, to this program and to the things that I'm telling you. Uh, if if you're if it's working for you. If it's keeping you from being depressed, if it's helping you to feel less depressed, if you're not bothered by the side effects, what do you care why it's working, whether it's a placebo or effect or not? Uh, you may you just want to continue on it. If you if it's not working for you, for you, and many people take antidepressants and they're still depressed, or if the side effects are really troublesome to you, which is also true for many uh, uh, people, you still can't just stop taking them on your own. And the reason is that one of the, I wouldn't call it a side effect really, but one of the effects of antidepressants for many people is to create a dependency. And if you just stop taking the drug, you can get withdrawal symptoms and they can be uh, fairly severe and problematic. So if you're going to uh, stop, you need to do so with medical guidance. You need to do so slowly. You need to talk to your doctor. Talk to your doctor before you make any changes. You also need to find an alternative. One of the things that we learned in our very first meta-analysis, the one on the, on the published literature, was that doing nothing doesn't, ha- doesn't lead to recovery. You have to do something. You need to intervene. The fortunate thing is that there seem to be a number of alternatives to drugs. If uh, in, up for, for quite a number of years now, antidepressant drugs have been the first thing that doctors turn to if they have a patient who is depressed. Now, you're depressed, even mildly depressed, we should give you an antidepressant. It should not be the first thing to turn to. If, it's to, if they're to be used at all, they should be a last resort. Antidepressants should be something that you would turn to. If other treatments don't work, if other alternatives don't work, if nothing else works, then perhaps you try an antidepressant because you want to try it, you want to find something. And if they don't work, you'd stop taking them again under medical guidance. But what you need to start emphasizing more, what we as a profession uh, need to start, and a society need to start emphasizing more, are different forms of intervention, different for, uh, alternatives, uh, different treatment options. What I find interesting in the medical field is that most doctors have a passing or even no knowledge in nutrition. I find that alarming um, and fascinating at the same time. That's you're talking about alternative approaches. That would that's number one. That's the first. What are you eating? What are you putting in? What am I putting into my body on a regular basis that can cause chemical um, changes that can cause sluggishness or whatever? There's a whole range. Um, what, what would you say to that? Well, I try to stick very close to the data. Mm. There may be nutritional causes or tr- nutritional changes that could uh, help with depression. They haven't been studied enough, so they haven't been evaluated. I can't say that they work. I can't say that they don't work because the studies haven't been done. We need to do more research. There needs to be more funding for research on, on, on various forms of, of intervention, including dietary intervention. But there are some things that have been investigated that we know do work. Exercise works. Physical exercise we know that works. The studies are very uh, uh, clear on that. They produce an, uh, a response that's about as great as the drug response, a little better than the placebo response. But if you think about what the side effects of, of uh, physical exercise are, they're great. You might take them just for the side effects, for uh, better health, uh, the longevity, better muscle tone, and, and, and so on. So that's one alternative, and perhaps the best studied alternative is psychotherapy, and, and especially um, a psycho- form of psychotherapy called cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT. Um, 
It's been studied in a large, fairly large number of clinical trials. In the short run, it produces effects very much like uh, antidepressant drugs, that is, it produces some benefit, but without the various side effects that uh, uh, you have with antidepressant drugs. And in the long run, that's where you see the real benefit because most people who are given drug treatment relapse, they get worse again, and uh, 10 to 20 sessions of CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, not only can help many people get better, but also they can produce lasting change so that people uh, don't get depressed again. And these are in studies going up to six years follow-up. Uh, where, where you can see this special benefit for, for cognitive behavior therapy with just a 10-week intervention and nothing more after that. Okay, okay, that's that's more more in line with uh, something that's humanistic. Have you come across the work of Professor Healy? Sure. He's been a pioneer, and, and uh, I think were it not for Healy's work, and uh, we would... Uh, not have known about this risk of suicide. He did some of the best data analysis on it. It was then taken up by the FDA. The FDA has uh, now reported an extensive analysis based on data that nobody else could have access to and found that, that he was right again. He, he has found that for, for people at all ages, the FDA data make it very clear for young people in particular, including young adults. Yeah, I mean, it's when I was doing a little research, the uh, he he had found out that uh, a lot of the the studies uh, had been done written by ghost writers, um, and that the pharmaceutical, uh, the big pharma industry, um, were I suppose behind the the manipulation. I don't want to use that word. The 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 skewing of the figures to uh, adjust so that they could. Um, lead to their own positive conclusions. Um, now, from with speaking with you, you seem to stick very to, as you say, the data. You don't get um, sidestepped into speculation or anything that you really can't uh, put on on paper. Um, SSRIs, um, uh, again, anecdotally, I have met people here in Donegal who have been on SSRIs from a period of six months to five years. And the one predominant uh, thing that I get, or the one predominant response, is that they're still depressed. And they're doing lots of other things as well. Um, that speaks to me that there's something seriously wrong here. Uh, so what, what do you say to that? Well, there are some people who do seem to benefit. There are some people who benefit and then get worse again. That's perhaps the, the, the biggest pattern that you'll see in initial response and then people uh, uh, relapsing. Um, and that, that's very, very common. I do think it's important to stick to the data, and I'll tell you why. Because if you just go with your clinical impressions, you wind up making all kinds of errors. Uh, one of the most common reactions that I get from physicians is, but you know, I know these drugs work. I know these drugs work because I've given them to my patients and, and many of them get better and some don't, but there's this group of patients that get a lot better when I give them the drugs. But of course, they never give the patients placebo, so they have no way of knowing whether it's a drug effect or a placebo effect when their patients get better. And that's why I think it's important to do the, the careful research and, and to look at what's going on, and that's the basis for the, uh, the claims that I made. I discovered something very interesting also about the, the whole idea of the SSRIs and the basis for SSRIs and how they're supposed to work. SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's a brain chemical. And um, what SSRIs are supposed to do is inhibit the reabsorption of, of, of this chemical serotonin so that there's more serotonin available in the brain. It's supposed to increase the level of serotonin that's uh, available in, in the brain. And the idea behind that is that perhaps depression is caused by not having enough serotonin in, in the brain. And uh, so if you increase it, you, 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 that's what makes people uh, better. 
one of the things I discovered when, after doing the various, I did three meta-analyses in the area, and after doing that, uh, at the invitation of an editor for, from Random House, I, I decided to expand it into, book, into a book, and I started looking at the literature more widely. And in the process of doing that, in the process of doing the research for the book, uh, one of the things that I came across is another kind of antidepressant. It's a, an antidepressant called tianeptine. It's a, uh, been approved in France by the regulators. It's prescribed there. It's prescribed in another, a number of other countries as well under a couple of different brand names. And tianeptine, instead of being an SSRI, is an SSRE, and that stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Enhancer. Instead of inhibiting the reuptake enhance, uh, uh, of, of serotonin, it enhances it. In other words, chemically, it works exactly the opposite. It should have the exact opposite effect of SSRIs, the most commonly used antidepressants. So SSRIs are supposed to increase serotonin in the brain. SSREs are supposed to decrease serotonin in the brain. If not having enough serotonin is what makes you depressed, SSREs should cause depression. In fact, they have the exact same beneficial effect. When you give people SSREs, you get the exact same beneficial effect as when you give them SSRIs. If you give people SSRIs in a clinical trial where you're comparing an SSRI with some other kind of drug, let's say uh, an SSRE, you get about 60% of people getting better. When you give them an SSRE, a drug that's supposed to decrease serotonin, about 60% get better. It's impossible. I can't imagine how drugs that have diametrically opposed chemical activity could chemically produce the same effect. Again, this suggests to me that the effect you're seeing is a placebo effect. Okay, there's a couple of things popping out at me there. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the drugs as you say, diametrically opposed, one inhibits, the other enhances. Right. Um, they're both dealing with symptoms. And they both assume or presuppose an effect whilst not actually having definitive proof that the effect is leading to, or sorry, that there is a cause leading to an effect, i.e. serotonin, imbalance is leading to depression so they're already um, from a from a simple model if there is a cause and an effect if you deal with the cause then the effect should uh, change but if you don't know what the cause is and you're assuming and you're throwing things at the effect i.e. take this pill for depression Okay, that seems to be doing okay. Let's let's now take this one for depression without actually knowing. Okay, what is the core cause? Then th that's insane. I mean, you can I could throw anything here. Take this red smarty pill. This will work a treat. I guarantee it. Hey, look at me. Look at me. I guarantee it. Bang. Do you see where I'm coming from? Sure. And the I mean, the one thing that's clear and just about all pharmacologists now who study in this area, I, I think would agree with this statement, is this idea that depression is caused by a deficiency of serotonin. They've now become convinced that's not true. They're looking for some other explanation to the, if SSRIs work, which I, I somewhat doubt, uh, if they do, nobody knows why they work, and it's certainly not working by uh, correcting a deficiency of serotonin. And the, the effects of TNF, you know, this SSRE, the, the selective serotonin reuptake enhancer, make that 100% uh, clear. We don't know that there is a chemical cause for depression. Maybe there is. I have some doubts about that. Mm -hmm. If there is, we don't know what it is, and we don't know that there is one. <laughs> we do know that there are environmental factors that um, increase rates of depression. We know that unemployment, uh, rises in unemployment are associated with increases in depression. We know that poverty is associated with depression. We know that unaffordable housing is associated uh, with depression. We know that the loss of a loved one uh, can provoke depression. 
We don't know whether some people might be more vulnerable to reacting with long-term depression as a result of these uh, life circumstances. That may be the case. We don't really know that. We know that to the extent that these kinds of factors, grief, loss, economic pressure, to the extent that they are dealt with in therapy, the therapy is more effective. So we know that environmental factors and perhaps the way in which you, you, you cope with environmental and, and, and social uh, factors uh, uh, may impact how, whether you get depressed, how depressed you get, how long the depression lasts. lasts. Um, those things are all likely to have effects on the brain, but whether there is a chemical effect that, that is producing the depression as opposed to these uh, uh, social causes and personal co interpersonal causes, we don't really know that. Yeah, we don't. And that's, that's the, the problem I have with the whole system is that we don't, and it's quite apparent, and there's data that suggests so, and um, industry insiders will agree, um, and yet the perception that is sold to the public that the, the depression can be alleviated uh, or remedied uh, with these antidepressants or with other types of um, antidepressants. And the, the scientific, um, I suppose, dressing up that's put on this, I mean, it's far from science, really. It's, it's pseudoscience that's been sold, and they're, they put a white coat on it, and they put a veneer of um, can-do and a veneer of um, you must accept this, and that's that's how it's it's put out. Now that's not just my perception. That's I've spoken to too many people um, who who have the same perception. Now maybe we're all under mass hypnosis, which is another uh, subject of yours that you would like to talk about. But maybe we'll get back to talk about that. Um, so I've, I'm a se I have a serious concern about if, as you say, sticking to the data, that there really isn't a yeah, and there isn't a statistical uh, difference to make. Uh, an antidepressant any better than a placebo. It's the side effects. There are stunning, n almost noxious side effects that if I, if I give you something knowingly that caused you your um, gastrointestinal tract to become sluggish and for you to then um, exhibit sexual dysfunction, you'd be knocking on my door going, hey, see that thing you give me? Yeah, um, the, the wife's not too happy. You, you know where I'm coming from again? Yeah, I do. It's important to keep in mind that there are some people who don't suffer from very serious side effects also. Uh, and for, there's some for whom the side effects are intolerable and, and others for whom it is not. And the problem is not with the studies per se. There are many well-done studies. The problem is with the, what did the, do the data from those studies really show. And the problem is with the withholding of data. One of the things that I think that we need at a societal level is mandatory publication of uh, the data from all the clinical trials that the drug companies run. They should, they should be published. They should be made available for people to look at so that they're not hidden, so that we can uh, understand what, are, what is really taking place. I agree. There are many... Yeah, and, and again, I'm not anti-drug. There are many good pharmacological products for many disorders, and uh, we've benefited tremendously uh, from the development of pharmacology. Um, but some things have not been have not have not uh, led to benefits, and some there's been. Uh, in the name of profit, there has been, or in the search for profit, there has been a withholding to, of the data to the point of leading to, to people not knowing what the scientific data really are and therefore not being able to make informed choices and informed decisions. There is the crux of it right there. Thank you. That is it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And... If anybody wants to get your book, The Emperor's New Drugs, Exploding the Antidepressed Myth, where do they go? Well, they could go to Amazon, of course, uh, online. Uh, they could go to uh, other bookstores, both online and, and in the stores. Um, it's available, uh, it's available in, in uh, both the 
UK edition and American edition. A uh, French edition has just come out. Um, a Polish edition is in the works. A Japanese edition has come out. Um, so there are many different editions of it and uh, covers this material in much greater uh, depth. And hopefully, in a way, it's written for the general public. So you don't have to be an expert to understand it, or to, to make sense of it. And it also talks about, again, the range of alternatives that are available uh, alternatives to dealing with depression and coping with it without the use of drugs. Okay. And folks, remember the missing White House tips. If anybody can get their hands on a copy, send it to me, Gabriel, at the Irish of the Moon .ie. I'll be glad to listen to it and not send it back to you. Dr. Irving Kirsch, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, have, You're very welcome. Have a great day thank for you, the rest sir. of the day. Thanks. Have, thanks for having me on the show. You're very, very welcome. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, Dr. Irvin Kirsch, certainly interesting with regards how minuscule the difference between placebo and the supposed uh, antidepressant is. Uh, makes you wonder, um, I mean, what, what's it all about? Is it profit? Is there some other nefarious idea behind it all? Irrelevant. The message that I got from Dr. Kirsch is the data speaks for itself. It's not logical to do what has been done. And if you link that in with some of the other shows and some of the other knowledge that's out there that's surfacing from the underground, then we all can help and educate each other. Uh, and it is, I believe, time to start to come in together in more public meetings and the, the local communities get together, have meetings, uh, discuss what can be done by us, for us, um, because if we wait for our elected governments um, or the corporations to do it, it will not get done. And we, as we are now fallen between the cracks, we will fall between the cracks. But if we get together, get motivated and get cooperative, uh, the sky is the limit. There's nothing we cannot achieve if we set our minds to it and allow the limiting beliefs that oh we can't do it or what can we do or other such uh, cliches that are almost like uh, mental viruses that are put in place to block us let them drop away sky's the limit what can we do what do we need to do what information is out there that we can start pulling together everything from clean water clean soil clean air how do we go about this clean energy if it's certainly not free then it's almost free um, start looking at um, ourselves each other on the planet as beings and entities and partnership was that at the end of the day or in at the end of the day yeah at the end of the day is what it's all about uh, it's not about profit it's not about a dog-eat-dog -dog world, which is a complete misnomer to begin with. And if you want to look up that, that's a very, very good spot to start with. Consider the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality that has been sold over the last hundred years. Um, and everybody assumes that it's derived from the observations of Charles Darwin in what he's seen in nature, when actual fact it's not. Nature is about cooperation, um, synchronicities. Nature is about uh, blending and again, it's cooperation. It's not about competition. Nature abhors competition. So look into that yourself. Find what you'll find and have a bit of fun as you're beginning to be curious about all these things. Because it's, as I say, it's only by coming together at the ground level, us human beings, uh, us individual sovereign human beings, grouping together to say, all right, we need to change. What can we do? And let your imagination soar. Next week, we'll be talking with Dr. Joseph Farrell about pyramids. One of my favorite fascinating subjects. There are pyramids all over the world. The most notable one is the pyramid, the Great Pyramid at Giza, Cheops. Well known, 
uh, considered the one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, but unbeknownst to most of the general public, there are pyramids in China much bigger, and there are pyramids dotted all over the planet. So it should be interesting um, delving into the work of Dr. Joseph Farrell. So join us next week. Join us online. Tune in on your local radio station. Thank you for listening. And if you have any comments or any suggestions, drop them along to Gabriel at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. Or if you have any suggestions for future guests, you can drop an email to Shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. Until next week, folks, stay safe, stay curious, and in time honored tradition, turn to the person on your right and give them a big hug. Later. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. This is just a ride. ride, ride, ride. We can change it any time we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now. Between fear and love. Love, love. Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.